Brandon Munro, how are you, sir? I'm well, Matt. Things are happening. Things are happening. Things are happening uh, quite quickly as well. And we're, we're going to rush through this because you've got places to be and people to see. Uh, and I've got checks to write. So um, we are going to start with what's been happening this week, Brandon. Well, we're seeing some momentum in uranium. We've, it feels like uranium spot price is going up by about a dollar each week. We've had the end of month print come out since we last recorded. And the basic summary is that prices are edging up across all forms of the nuclear fuel cycle. So enrichment's up, conversion's up, uranium spot prices up, and we even saw a big lift in the midterm price up to $59. Now, for people just joining us on this uh, investment journey, the way that the uranium price is broken up is there's a spot price, which is for deliveries within a three month window. Then there's a midterm price, which is kind of a bit under the discretion of the price recorders, but essentially anything between three months and two years. And then there's a long term price or a long term contract price, uh, which has got a lot of uh, judgment and calculations behind it. So we're seeing the spot price push up through $57. Midterm price, as I say, got written from 54 up to 59 in one go, which raised a few eyebrows and a steady increase in conversion and enrichment as well. Now, what's been driving that, at least from the sentiment perspective, are two things. One is Zuri Invest has closed its fund and appears to be active in the market. And of course, no trader worth their salt wouldn't be trying to front run a new fund that's uh, sitting with bulging pockets with $100 million and two million pounds of uranium on its shopping list. So I suspect that uh, not all of the liquidities, the chaps at Zuri trying to position themselves, there's probably quite a lot of related activity as well. Now, the other thing that's got tongues wagging is Diablo Canyon, PG&E, the operators of that uh, Renaissance flagship the nuclear power station in California of all places that got a second lease on life and was uh, saved from early closure. They went out with a request for tender for five reloads. Uh, so they basically wanted to ensure that their near term future was secure in one foul swoop. So that was worth a uranium equivalent of about six million pounds, although most of that material was in the form of EUP, enriched uranium product. So that was a big order and there was tongues fluttering furiously amongst the sector. Uh, would the sector be able to provide that much EUP at short notice? Uh, what would it do to prices? And the end result we're now seeing filtering into the those various prices across the nuclear fuel cycle. Now, what the what PG&E, the utility discovered, which probably is known to every utility on the planet by now is first of all, there was no cheap uranium. So there were no pockets of $40 uranium who were just waiting for the chance to liquidate their holding. And that was really dispelled the last of the mythical hopes of some uranium players that these 50 to $55 prices are temporary. Uh, we're well and truly into a new pricing dynamic. Um, what we also saw though was a successful filling of that tender. And I think that's a great example of the nuclear industry really coming together to say, here is a flagship icon of the way the world is now thinking about nuclear power. It's Diablo Canyon, it's in California. It's been given a chance to extend or first of all, live its natural commercial life and then extend beyond that. And they've really made sure collectively that it can get its fuel and that uh, they don't have a, you know, a negative momentum message that goes out to the world, which is, well, there isn't enough uranium. So Diablo Canyon is fueled up. I think it's a great move on their part because they've, they haven't left themselves vulnerable to additional reloads when things really will get tight. They've gone a little bit aggressive and a little bit early, and that's what they should have done. And what it's also really now done is focus the mind of financial investors on a topic that we've talked about a lot on this show, Matt, and that is the fact that restarts or um, flip-flops from reactors that were about to be turned off that are now being extended, those types of uh, events 
have a profound effect on the market, more so than a new reactor that has five years to start getting ready. So we've got a few in the pipeline. Uh, we talked a couple of weeks ago about how Belgium has made the political decision to extend some of its reactors rather than close them down early. Uh, however, they're still in the throes of negotiating between the government and the utility to enable them to actually buy the fuel that they need to extend those reactors. So we're waiting on those. There's a couple of examples such as Palisades where we don't know yet, but Holtec and a consortium are trying to restart that reactor, uh, which was closed down. And uh, then if you really want to get optimistic and you really want to lay back on your bed and dream, then you can think about the impact of a return to long lost sensible energy policy in Germany. And uh, that small sliver of hope that we might see a restart of some of those still viable reactors there. And, and uh, I think nothing would please the nuclear world more than uh, that occurring. Then you've got other political jurisdictions such as South Korea, which have very recently changed their nuclear policy. Japan, which is, although very well stocked with uranium, uh, very much turning a 180 in terms of their nuclear power policy and what's been pushed through from government from high up. Uh, and even if you look across other markets, um, we're seeing that, that shift where people are modelling a plant to switch off, but we will probably see it extended. And whenever it's extended at short notice, such as what we've now seen with Diablo Canyon, it has these very profound market effects. So there, there is a, a series of mini catalysts coming up over the next one to two years that gives financial investors something to, to watch for and something to react to. Yeah, I mean, it, I think it'd be um, probably incorrect to think that every single restart which stocks up uh, will have the same effect on price um, here. But obviously, momentum is the big player here. Tiago is, is, is the first one to kind of move into market and move big. They've gone aggressive for sure. And, and as you say, with some of the restarts that you, you, you've named there and others which you have not, um, it should have a, well, hopefully quite a big impact on, on, on pricing. The difficult bit is trying to understand the timing for that, clearly. But can you just explain to some of the newbies here, perhaps joining us for this uh, uranium investing voyage we've, we've all been on and hopefully um, will be the beneficiaries of, how quickly does, because obviously these, these reactors are buying enriched uranium, how quickly does that cascade down into the pricing for uranium as, as an uranium ore that you, you guys are um, going to be selling because you know the name of the game for you guys is you've got to get contracts you've got to get contracts which allow your projects to be economic it, will it, is it immediate or do you think it is it a bit a bit of a waiting game well that's that's a big question because when a reactor acquires EUP, effectively what they're acquiring is enrichment that's bundled with conversion that's bundled with uranium. Now, of the Western enrichers, uh, Arano is the only one who actually participates in all three levels of the nuclear fuel cycle. If it's Urenco, then they would need to either offer their enrichment together with an offering from a converter and an offering from a uranium producer, or they would need to acquire those other parts of the nuclear fuel cycle and bundle it up themselves. And from what I understand, there was a combination uh, to, with the Diablo Canyon. So there was a combination of the enrichers providing their own EUP and also acquiring what was necessary to basically package up a response to that tender. Now, going forward, it can continue in that way. And what's really changed, this is a bit out of newbie territory, Matt, but certainly for the uh, uranium followers out there, what has really changed in the last couple of years is the enrichers a couple of years ago during the underfeeding years, they were able to offer EUP as a single product because they created EUP from underfeeding and they were even contracting with that. But uh, as we now know, in the Western world, there is no more underfeeding. And the question is now, what are the tails assays and are we at neutral or are we already at overfeeding? So the enrichers can't do that anymore. So every time they offer an EUP deal, they will need to find the uranium. And equally, every time a utility buys enrichment, 
that then gives them the impetus and the reason to buy the conversion and then to buy the uranium. So the relationship is present in both of those forms there, Matt. As, as to answer your question about how immediate it is, uh, well, it depends. If it's all wrapped up in the one contract, as we saw, it is immediate because you need to bundle those offers up to give a single response to tender. If the utility is breaking up those components themselves, then it's not immediate, but it does tend to follow within a period of time. And that's really where the market is generally at the moment. Most utilities have got their eyes still on enrichment and conversion. And once they've solved that piece of the puzzle, they'll then be moving down towards uranium. Okay, we're going to move quickly um, through this because, like I say, you've got places to be. Um, winner of the week, friend of the show, I think. <laughs> who are you awarding that to? Well, I'll come back to who the actual winner is in just a moment. But the event that constitutes the winner of the week is the spin out by American Lithium of the Makassani Uranium Project in Peru. Now, this is a project that's been around for a while. Many people would remember it as Plateau Energy Metals. And back in about two years ago, May 21, is when American Lithium acquired by, by a merger um, all of the shares in Plateau. So they've done a really clever thing. They've bought both a uranium and lithium project because the, the two minerals were um, co-present at that uh, in the mountains there in Peru. And then they've worked out the lithium value there and combined it with their American lithium, US lithium assets. And now they're ready to cut free the uranium assets. And the reason why it's a clever move is it would need to be an extraordinarily good uranium project to have got enough of its own attention over the last couple of years in a lithium company. You know, let's face it, lithium has been incredibly hot. It's been urgent. And so this gives this uranium asset the chance to have its own management, its own focus, its own time, and its own opportunity to develop without being under the shadow or under the wing of a lithium or two lithium projects, really. Now, the actual winner of the week are the good folk who invested in a company called Friday's Dog Holdings. Now, I, have, I really had to reach for that one, Friday's Dog Holdings. Now, um, for those of us who don't follow the market as well as we perhaps should, Friday's Dog Holdings is a listed company where someone thought that there was clearly a niche to be had selling dog shampoo. Now, it'll surprise many people out there, but the dog shampoo company didn't quite make a goal of it and found themselves as a shell. And it was into that vehicle that the reverse takeover spin out of the Makassani uranium project in Peru has is to be transacted. So Friday's Dog Holdings is becoming a uranium company. And we do jest, of course, uh, as many people already have on Twitter. But the point is that the the shareholders who were probably really wondering if they would ever make a cent out of dog shampoo are now being catapulted into the brilliant world of uranium investing at a time that is really quite ominous. And we're, as we've mentioned at the beginning of this show, it's at a time when really the momentum is starting to pick up in uranium. So I would call them the winners and well done also to the management at American Lithium who are cutting this asset free to pursue its own future. And it just needs to be said, that this, is, this is not a Friday dog of a deal. Uh, this is uh, actually a good boy uh, deal. So uh, well, well done to American Lithium and uh, well done to those people who thought shampooing dogs might be, I don't know, profitable. Who knew? Who knew? Right, we better rush, rush on. Okay, my favourite section of the week every week is Bungle of the Week. Who's going to get it this week? What do you reckon? Well, it's being awarded to the UK Greens Party via Carla Denya. And uh, the reason is that she went on an interview with BBC and made the following statement. Nuclear is between 8 and 11 times more carbon intensive than renewable energy. Boom. Now, there's a lot of science <laughs> to say that that is absolute bollocks. And yep. I, I, I was a bit hesitant whether to award the bungle of, bungle of the week to Carla because bungle is a soft word 
for what looks to me to be a big porky pie. Um, it's science denial at its finest. And there's an overwhelming amount of scientific evidence that says that that is simply not true. It's nowhere near true. And we'll put in the show notes uh, the most recent credible study, which is from the United Nations, their Economic Commission on Europe, which did a full life cycle assessment of all forms of electricity. Now, what they found was the full life cycle. So that's everything from expiration through to decommissioning, disposal of waste, everything you could think about to do with nuclear and the same with other forms of energy, uh, electricity. Now, what they found was that the carbon intensity, and this is grams of carbon dioxide equivalent, because there are other greenhouse gases emitted by coal and other things, grams of carbon dioxide equivalent per kilowatt hour. Now, for nuclear energy, it was between 5.1 and 6.4 grams. Now, the, the discrepancy, which is quite fine, but the discrepancy depends on things like the nature of the uranium mined, how big the power plant is, and so forth. Now, this is why what the Greens UK are peddling is so irresponsible. So first of all, 5.1 is demonstrably the lowest of any form of electricity, including hydro. Now, even at the highest end of the band for nuclear power, which is 6.4, that's still lower than everything except the lowest form of hydro. In other words, the favourite from the Greens, which is wind and solar, under all circumstances, onshore, offshore, photovoltaic, whatever, at its lowest is still a higher carbon footprint than the highest form of nuclear energy. So I don't know where the eight or 10 or 11 times came from. It sounds like one of those numbers that's been thrown out there to sound very scientific and very factual. Um, maybe she just made it up on the spot. That seems to be what a lot of anti-nuclear people do. And they just think that the, the public are gullible enough. But hopefully in this day and age with access to Twitter and access to Google, uh, access to Snopes and other fact-checking uh, fact resources, people are going to start seeing through some of this fear-mongering. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's interesting. I, I think the Green Party have lost that argument and desperate people do and say desperate things. Um, but they, they, Greenpeace and, and others, need to start looking at the numbers, need to also appreciate that people are unable to pay for the current, you know, and en cost of um, energy, cost of heating their homes, um, cost of powering their cars. It, it's just got too much. Nuclear is the solution. There we go. Po oh, trying to be the poster boy just for, well, for that one minute um, on that topic. Um, but yeah, uh, Agree with you totally. It's 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 insane. You, you you they've got to be picked up. They've got to be held accountable. And saying stuff like that deserves you know. Sim I mean, what happens if the other side just starts making stuff up like that too? It's 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 ludicrous. Got to be a bit more adult about it. Um, okay, a, again a bit a, li a little bit more um, uh, not fun, but a little bit more uh, serious here. Tweet of the week. Um, quite interesting. Who have, you, who have you awarded that to? Well, very interesting in, indeed. Uh, over the last week, we've seen a lot of talk about Parnassus Investments. Uh, they're one of the sort of sustainable investment giants of the sector, um, quietly announcing that, in fact, their restriction on nuclear energy was to be lifted. Now, it's not quite the same as saying that they're going all in on nuclear power, but what it does mean is nuclear energy is being taken out of the sin bin it's been removed from the list of restriction investments such as tobacco, such as gaming, such as arms, and allowed to be investable according to their criteria and their mandates on its own investment merits. Now, that's a big deal because they are one of the leaders in the sector and this is one of the first real strong indications that uh, Perhaps the deal that Cameco have done um, with the Westinghouse acquisition, um, which was done alongside the largest renewables private equity firm in the world, is starting to have these sort of ripple effects. Uh, this intent was announced about the same time that Cameco announced the deal. It was uh, they started mooting this idea back in November last year, and now they've made this decision. 
Uh, now, there's a bunch of different people who commented on what was actually a Morningstar article that talked about this. But the tweet of the week goes to Nucleation Capital. Let's put that one up there because they did what any good researcher ought to do and they went to the source and they tweeted back in May 26th that, oh, look at this little quiet announcement from Parnassus that we've now included um, nuclear in our investable universe. It wasn't noticed back on May the 26th, but as the people who saw it first and put it up on the platform first, well done, Nucleation Capital, you get Tweet of the Week, even though it wasn't tweeted this week. Okay. okay. Well, have a look at that article. Um, we'll also put the tweet there, but we'll put a link to, um, to the article. It's, it's, it's interesting. So I'm seeing these, these big players starting to move into and have permission to move into uh, investing in nuclear. Um, I, I would say there's probably another big discussion about you know, the same sorts of moves the other way out of coal, uh, oil and gas, fossil fuels more broadly, because I think we do need all of the above uh, in different types of use cases. So, you know, we're we're pro-energy on this show, pro-energy uh, and definitely pro-nuclear um, in, in there. Um, but I've got a question for you. We'll call it question of the week. OK, um, you, your project's based in, in Namibia. Some say you know a lot about doing business in, in Namibia. Um, so a headline said um, that the Namibian government has banned the export of critical minerals. Um, although it doesn't seem to include uranium, um, this can't be good for foreign direct investment into country, can it? Well, the, the headlines are not good. And this is a very good example of the way the news cycle operates. So because New, uh, Namibia was in the news a couple of weeks ago, uh, the good folk at Reuters have been pouring through all of the very dry and boring stuff that emanates from parliamentary media releases. And they picked up the two paragraph summary of a cabinet decision about the export of raw ore, in other words, DSO shipping of certain critical minerals. Now, because it was only two paragraphs, and it was designed to simply basically say to people who watch Namibian Parliament, yes, this was approved. The detail then comes from the, from the um, cabinet papers. Now, the headline implied that Namibia is now banning uh, the export of critical minerals. But what we understand, and I checked it with our colleagues over the weekend at the Chamber of Mines, is that no, it is only the ban of unprocessed ores uh, in DSO shipping, which is something that you rarely see in the Namibian context, but it was brought about because a Chinese company did the wrong thing and they actually got successive approvals to export 120,000 tonnes of higher grade lithium pegmatite. And it went all the way in raw orm, ore form, i.e. blow it up, dig it up, put it on a truck and put it on a ship out to China. So that's not what they were allowed to do. That's not what Namibia wants them to do. And because it was well and truly in the local Namibian media cycle with a big furor around it, Cabinet has taken those steps. And um, so it relates to the raw processing of rare earths, of cobalt, of lithium. And other than these smaller, higher grade lithium pegmatites, I don't think there's any other ore in those categories that could possibly be direct shipped in any case. So it's probably a nothing burger. Um, we, the Chamber's now getting clarity, but because it was announced so soon after a proper media cycle talking about Namibia's um, uh, debate around how they get an appropriate takeout of their oil discoveries, it of course has extended the news cycle. So um, I don't think there's anything to be worried about uh, it's already seems to be blowing over and uh, there'll be um, quite a lot of clarity on that as we see what the cabinet decision actually was rather than the two paragraph summary of it. Once again, the media excel them, uh, and exceed <laughs> oh, low expectation of them. Uh, it'd be nice if they actually, um, you know, stuck with that story and then kind of printed either a retraction or actually clarification of what um what the Namibian government is actually doing, rather than sensational headlines. But there we go. Um, I think we've just got time for Moonshot and Fizzers of the Week. Um, we're going to go to quite an important part of the world, Kazakhstan, aren't we? It's a 50-50 bet over time whether it would be a moonshot for the uranium sector or whether it will just fizzle out. 
And the reason I've put Kazakhstan on today's agenda is because there's been a number of different articles all around the same sort of thing, which goes back to one of our favourites on this show, which is talking geopolitics. So, for example, the Astana Times wrote an article that uh, talked about the fact that Kazakhstan is considering joining the BRICS alliance. And uh, we saw that in another article as well from a different publication. We'll put the links to both of those. And then some more discussion around how Russia and China are seeking to dominate the export of nuclear reactors and where Kazakhstan will play a role there. So it's a long term moonshot or fizzer to watch. It's how much does Kazakhstan get squeezed between its great trading and cultural partner to the north and its dominant trading partner to the south. Um, Kazakhstan is a landlocked country, of course. Uh, it's uh, enormously influenced by both Russia and China. And it's tried to maintain a little portal out to the west. It's trying to maintain at least one trading facet out to the west, which is incredibly important for uranium, um, less so for most other minerals, um, except perhaps oil and gas. So that's the tightrope that Kazakhstan needs to walk. If we did find Russia and China encroaching either, even further onto its uranium industry, then given it's a producer of more than 40% of the world's uranium, that of course will have a profound effect on this sector and a profound effect on Western buyers of uranium who will need to go to other places like Africa, like Namibia where Bannerman is, and uh, in time it would create additional um, demand and additional impetus for greater diversity of supply. And the point here is the news flow regarding Kazakh uranium and Kazatom Prom over the last six months has been pointing in that direction in any case. Not that, you know, I'm not saying necessarily that Kazatom Prom is about to get squeezed and sandwiched between Russia and China, but everything that's gone on in that region. Um, including what we talked about a couple of weeks ago on the show with speculation about management exodus out of Kazatom Prom and so on. It is leading Western utilities to rethink, well, how much of their uranium portfolio can be governed by cheap prices that they get out of Kazatom Prom and how much needs to be governed by sensible supply diversification, including an increase and a re resumption of the role that African uranium needs to play in balancing both the geographic diversity and the commercial diversity in this sector. Big topic. I wish we had time to actually whiz through it, but I'm going to have to call, call it a day. That We'll maybe come back to that next week because it's, it's, uh, the implications are huge in terms of that buying behaviour. And as we saw at the beginning of the show, you know, someone like you know, uh, Diablo coming and stepping into the market, trying to get that certainty of supply, um, has such a big impact. So, Brian, thank you very much. We'll speak to you next week. Thanks, Matt.